Hello everyone and welcome back to day 39 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So um, today I'm hoping to uh, continue some work on uh, on the fourth system we've been working on and thinking about it over the weekend and cleaning some stuff up and um, uh, actually haven't been able to kind of get a lot of the stuff out of my brain so I kind of want to work on it until I feel uh, kind of happy with it. Um, the plan is still to do the uh, kind of the assembly uh, language how-to uh, this week, probably next stream. Um, but I, I want to get this into a better uh, a better point uh, with the fourth stuff before we move to that. Um, all right. Um, so where did we leave off? Uh, I can't remember exactly. No, I, I I can kind of remember. We had bootstrapped ourselves to the point where we had. Um, I can't remember exactly what of this is new. But I remember we had if then and begin uh, again. I don't know if we had uh, yeah, until, um, but we had some of the basics. And I've since cleaned up some of the code um, since we uh, we had a really long stream last time. I think it was five hours in two sessions back to back. So um, I cleaned it up after that and um, have been thinking about some some bootstrapping structure and stuff for the rest of it as well. And that's kind of what I want to focus on today. Um, and what actually what I was tinkering with right before the stream started. So let me get right back into that. Um, let me just orient myself. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about is um, um, you know, like one of the cool things about Fourth is how you can bootstrap uh, a fairly complete system from very little, and um, I've been thinking about um, how I want to do that, um, you know, more so than what we were already doing. Um, we, we already did a bunch of bootstrapping last time, but um, I wanted to bring it back even further. So one of the things I've been thinking about is, um, and already have working actually, although there's still some other stuff I want to do, is, um, so I think we can straight up delete this now. Um, let's make sure I didn't break stuff. Um, is to basically, uh, like previously, we had hard coded um, an interpreter that would, you know, selectively, depending on whether something was a um, to be executed in immediate mode or compiled, uh, would do the right thing, depending on, you know, a combination of whether that word was marked as an immediate word and whether uh, the current uh, state was. Uh, immediate mode or compilation mode. Um, and uh, I realized that you can actually bootstrap that part. And so now I actually moved our interpret function back to, um, I moved our interpret function uh, back to just being a simple interpreter. So it always interprets, you, know, you can see it, it reads the next uh, word um, converts it to a code field address and then executes it. Uh, whereas before it was only doing this when uh, when you're in, you know, when either it was an immediate uh, word or you're in immediate mode. Um, and then what I'm doing right now, and this is what we'll be continuing along with other things. Um, let me just delete this. Um, the, the first thing I do then, um, is so so again because this is uh, this thing here which is part of the the infinite loop that starts uh, the whole process because um, because this is just an interpreter um, until we bootstrap a new interpreter or a new a, a new command loop that can basically also compile selectively like the old uh, interpret function uh, everything will just be executed immediately. And so the first thing, the very first uh, act we will do is to create a new interpret function, which basically acts like the old the old one we had hard coded, meaning, um, you know, selectively depending on whether, uh, you know, so, so let's re rehearse what this does. Read the next word, find it in the dictionary, um, find its code field, um, and then check if the word is immediate or if the mode is immediate mode. Uh, and if so, we just, um, compile an entry to that uh, word, otherwise we execute it immediately. Um, so, uh, so this is, you know, this here is being executed by the old interpret function. Now we create a function called quit, 
Um, quit is just an infinite loop that calls interpret forever. Um, that's conventionally what this thing is called in fourth. And um, and after having done this, so now because we've created this new interpret, the definition of quit refers to the new interpret, not to the built-in interpret. Uh, and then when we call quit, we now enter this new infinite loop, and that is the one that's going to do everything subsequently. So everything from here on out will be executed, not by the original interpret function, but by our own, which means that we now have this selective compilation feature that we had originally, but now it's bootstrapped from a simpler built-in interpret function. Um, so that's pretty neat. And uh, one of the things I was working on and want to continue doing now is to basically do more of that kind of thing, like move more stuff, um, like make make the, the built-in words be even more basic uh, and uh, bootstrap the more elaborate functionality. So basically, I guess one way of putting it is right now, the built-in functionality, there is no compiler. There's just a really dumb interpreter. Um, then our very first act is to bootstrap a compiler, which is what this is, um, and, and a new command loop. Um, and in fact, uh, not only that, but even, so previously we also had immediate as a built-in, like the word, this thing here makes the current word or the latest word makes it immediate, marks it immediate by setting uh, a one bit in the, um, in the flags field. And so this was also previously hard-coded. Um, we only really need this once we have the compiler, right? Because this has no meaning. Everything is in some sense immediate when we just have the built-in interpreter that always uh, immediately executes everything. But once we have the selective compilation, uh, we need this in order to mark words as being immediate. Uh, and we were using it before, like here, for example, in order to exit compilation mode with semicolon, a semicolon needs to be a, a immediate word. and um, Previously, this was using the built-in definition of immediate. Now, there is no built-in definition of immediate. We are bootstrapping it ourselves and then using it here. Uh, and it does exactly what the old one did. In fact, the way I've been creating these words is just by taking, you know, they were already defined as fourth words. They were just, you know, assembled, compiled using the assembler hard-coded style rather than, um, you know, doing it, um, uh, rather than doing it with sort of from, from, from string data, like here. Um, so, so yeah, that's working, uh, and, and all this is doing is what the thing was doing before, which is it's loading, uh, it's loading the latest uh, dictionary entry, it's um, finding the address of the flags field, and then it's loading that, um, it's uh, setting the the lowest bit to one, which is what it does by oring in this one, and then it's storing it back to that field and exiting. So um, that's the idea there. And so, uh, in fact, it's conventional to make immediate itself be immediate. So um, we could do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's still working, uh, which also means that now, even though conventionally you put, conventionally you put immediate uh, after the semicolon, which means we're back in immediate mode by the time this executes. So immediate itself would not need to be an immediate word, um, but um, some people like to write, write it like this um, rather than putting it at the end. And this requires immediate to be an immediate w uh, word for that to work, um, but let's make sure that that works. So that works, um, but I think if we remove this, that would not work. Okay, that does work. I guess actually we're not using uh, those are bad examples because I don't think we're using uh, these two right now. Let's uh, let's pick something else, like um, this one. Definitely not work. If it's not in immediate mode, word. Oh, it would. Oh, it's because we still have this here. So yeah. Anyway, it still worked. And then if we remove this, I think it won't work. Yeah, it's stuck. So um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, 
I guess while I'm here, before I get on with the bootstrapping, let me just uh, explain some of these new immediate words that, that basically just expand the existing ones we defined last time. So last time we only have it, we only had if and then. I added else, and really all else does is um, um, I think I have a example here. So you know, as before, you have the condition flag on the stack, then you have if, and then you have the 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 true block of code, uh, and then you have then, oh, and then you have else, and you have the false block, and then you have then, after which is, you know, whatever the successor code is for both of those branches. Um, and the way uh, else works is quite simple. Um, the um, it, it first compiles a an unconditional jump at the end of the current block, basically so that the then branch can skip the else branch um, if, if an else branch exists. Um, and so in order to do that, uh, you have to do back patching. So you insert a jump, uh, and then you, you initially write a, a dummy zero for the, for the jump target, but you record the, um, the location of that dummy target so that you can go in and back patch it later. And in fact, the code that back patches it is going to be then. Uh, so then originally back patched the skip for the if, but now it also, you know, just works uniformly. It will also back patch the else target. Um, and then um, the else has to also do the back patching for the if, so that you know if the branch is false, it will jump immediately here. So that's how simple it is to do if then else um, and forth uh, sort of as immediate words and just sort of on top of this existing substrate. Um, and there's a similar thing here. I can't remember if we did until last time, but. Um, uh, begin again was the basic stuff we did, which is just an unconditional infinite loop. Uh, begin just pushes the, the the current location on this on the stack at compile time, so you know where the loop header is, and again just jumps back to that. So it compiles a jump, and this will grab uh, this thing will grab uh, whatever location was pushed by begin and jump back up there. Uh, until is sort of the same idea, but now uh, the, the that backward branch is conditional on um, on you know whatever the runtime stacks top entry is so uh, this is like a do while loop except rather than being a do while it's do until uh, but that's the idea uh, and then I guess I also didn't have these last time um, these two immediate words for defining variables and constants um, variable defines a word sized variable um, it reads the name of the variable using create at run, uh, runtime. So variable counter makes a variable called counter. And what it does is it uses, um, this acts kind of like the built-in lit function, uh, where this is just a normal non-immediate word, um, but it assumes that the next thing in the word definition after it is, uh, you know, is a data field that's going to store the variable value. And this basically pushes the address of that field and so anytime you call a uh, counter uh, like here, it will push the address of this field here. Um, and then you can read to it and write from it like, uh, like any other address. Um, in the case of a constant, um, you uh, have you know, the, the constant value on top of the stack when you call this immediate word. Uh, and then it just compiles you know, a, a word that has a literal with that value. So compile uh, the lit word. And then the um, you know whatever is on top of the stack is going to get uh, made the literate uh, the, the the lit and uh, it, and it exits. Note by the way a small subtlety which is that um, uh, there is no exit in this word and that's intentional. You could put it there, but it would not never be hit. And the reason is um, the way I get things from the top of the return stack means that when this word exits, it's actually going to jump to the return address of the original function that called it. And so the exit here is subsumed by the implicit exit here. So small subtlety, but um, you know, a little bit of, of, of an efficiency hack. Um, and so here you can see some examples like three put digit uh, reads that constant we initialized, name three. And with variables, you have to explicitly use fetch and store in order to get the value and set the value. So the initial value um, is zero. As you can see, everything is zero initialized. Um, uh, and then we uh, 
read a value from the keyboard, uh, set the counter value to that, and then read it again. So you can see the thing we were seeing at startup here is three is from the constant, zero is from the initial value of the counter. Uh, and then if I type um, nine, we get back a nine because we store the nine into that counter variable and then we read it back and do a put digit. So that is the idea behind that. Um, and here we have it done. Like the, 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 the infinite loop here basically reads a digit uh, if it's zero, it increments it and displays it. Otherwise, it decrements it. Um, and so, um, well, the first one is just the one that initializes the variable. Um, but then subsequently, if, if it's five, we get four because it decrements it. But if I type, you know, if I type one, we get zero because it decrements it. But if I type zero, it increments it to one. So um, that's just a, sort of a dumb demo of um, of if else, basically which we didn't have last time. We only had if then. We now have if, if else then. So anyway, um, that was it for the stuff I did sort of off stream in terms of these features. These are basic fourth features you see in every system pretty much, I think. Um, right, back to the, some of the bootstrapping. So um, um, I was trying to, when when the, right before I started recording the stream, I was trying to move this immediate uh, that this is immediate word. Uh, I was trying to move that into the the bootstrap code. There's no reason that should not be bootstrapped. Uh, if you go and look what the code does, I'm just going to copy it for reference while we're uh, writing it. I was doing this before the stream started, but I couldn't get it to work for some reason. Um, so we create a word called um, called the same thing. And again, remember that because of the search order for the dictionary, if you create a word that's named the same thing as a previous word, any new word searches will always hit the most recent entry. Um, maybe to later today, we'll show a feature called hiding where uh, entries can be hidden so that they still exist, but um, and they still have a name, but um, you can hide them. But either temporarily, like uh, one thing that's very common is um, you want to define a word um, with a given name that already exists, and then you want to implement the new word in terms of the old word, and so you don't want to hide, you don't want to shadow the old definition. And so one thing that's convenient is while you're defining a word with colon, you want to hide the current definition you're building so that references to that word doesn't just hit itself, um, but you can use the previous definition. Uh, and so make that the default. You can use, um, you, you, you can use a flag to hide that. Um, but anyway, that's not a, a built-in feature. That's something we can add ourselves. Um, but anyway, let's do, um, but, but that's the idea is that we were defining something with the same name, but the old entry is still there. Uh, and anything that's already been compiled that referenced the old entry will still have that pointer to the old entry. Um, but any new searches based on name, like this one here should now hit, uh, after the create should hit our new definition. That's the idea. All right. So, um, so this was already a fourth word, but we were hand compiling it, um, using the assembler. Uh, and now we basically just have to do the same stuff. Um, and so um, let's see what this is. Uh, we, we get a, uh, a pointer on top of the stack to a, uh, to a word entry, uh, a dictionary entry. And so first we convert it to a flags pointer. Um, and then we have to load from that. Um, and uh, then we have to and it with um, the immediate bit mask, which is just one. It's the same thing we have down here um, because we want to see if that's set. And so we're going to um, compile that literal and uh, we're going to and it. And then we're going to check if it's non-zero. And I, I don't think that's needed in this case because ending with one is going to produce either zero or one. And so it already has um, logical value of being zero or one. Um, there's no reason to do other stuff. Um, and so this should be enough, and then we have to exit. And this is what I tried to do off stream and couldn't get it to work. Uh, let me let me first, by making a dummy name, let me first make sure it actually compiles. Uh, well, stuff still works. And then if I do this, now um, our bootstrapped uh, interpret function should hit this. And this is the part I, uh, I had a I don't know if it was a typo or some deeper issue that I hit right before the stream started, but let's see if this works. 
Okay, so that actually works. Um, so I must just have had a typo when I did this originally. Um, and one way we can test that it works is to, I mean, for example, if I did this, um, if, if, I, if I always return zero, uh, let me just make sure this definition is being hit, which, I, which it should be, but let's, let's verify it by just always uh, emitting a zero. So it, it says that nothing is ever immediate. That will break some, some stuff. Yeah, that's going to break a bunch of stuff. So that word is definitely being hit, uh, and that seems to be working as intended. And what that means is we can now get rid of our hard-coded definition, and there should be nothing referencing it now. Um, and we are one step closer to some kind of tighter bootstrapping. Um, One of the eventual goals uh, of what I want to do, I mean, there's a couple, but one of them is to, um, you know, when you're bootstrapping, there's a bunch of stuff you need to get off the ground. But once you're bootstrapped, you can actually re, you can you can completely kick out the ladder from underneath you and um, and do things on your own. So, for example, um, you know, once we have redefine this interpret function. We needed the interpret function in order to interpret the code that replaces the interpret function, but once it's been replaced, the original one is no longer needed. So it's purely scaffolding. Uh, so we can completely remove that. Um, any references in the, the running code, uh, we just need to get to this point. Um, and we could even overwrite the memory that contained the old entry if we set up the memory correctly to, to, uh, to, to support that. Um, and there's still other stuff here um, that you know, we can uh, we we could remove, and there's a question of how far you should go and whether how much value it has. And some of it is just kind of rote that doesn't really serve any, I think, philosophical uh, doesn't serve any role, um, educational role or conceptual role. Um, but but other stuff that I think is interesting to do this too to kind of remove those dependencies. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, one of them, for example, is Word. Because especially because Word right now is implemented in, um, yeah, I mean this was this is some of the first stuff we wrote on stream a few streams ago, and all of this right now is written using assembly code, which is a blemish. There's no reason, by the way, this needs to be written in assembly code. Um, that was just how it was done. So uh, I want to. Uh, I want to remove the need for that, basically. I think right now we're not even using key, right? Okay, so we can just remove this completely because we're going to be redefining redefining this. Um, right, so it's word and find. Those are the two, like there's this low level stuff which is written in assembly and some of this is going to stay written in assembly. You can actually replace it um, if you emit assembly code directly to memory, uh, which we totally can and maybe we'll write a simple Risk five assembler that runs at runtime and creates fourth words that are implemented in assembly that has been assembled by our assembler written in fourth. It's a lot of a lot of layers, but um, for now, you know, we have some primitives, and I'm not actually worried about necessarily reducing dependencies on these primitives. The way I think about it is there's a there's what you, there's a, like a very primitive virtual machine which acts much like a CPU in the sense that you know it has some basic operations and binary and unary operations. And because it's a stack machine, there's also some stack manipulation words. Um, and some of these can be implemented in terms of others, but I'm not actually too bothered by minimalism of this set of things because to me these are just like you know whether you have to synthesize minus rote from two rotes or um, Gosh, or you know, you can implement uh, addition in terms of subtraction with, with by negating it first, and so on. Like you can do all that stuff. I don't consider that kind of minimal bootstrapping to be super interesting because that's kind of like, duh. You, of course, you can do that. The stuff that I think is interesting is really more on the fourth specifics of like, you know, the fact that it has this interesting dual mode interpretation and compilation model, and, and all these other cool ideas. So I'm less I'm less interested in. Um, I'm much less interested in reducing uh, this set of things to to a small number or replacing them after uh, after we, we bootstrap. So um, 
Although I think one thing that would be helpful now that I'm looking at this is maybe to define some macros to, auto, to, to automate some of it. So uh, maybe let's do that while we're here. Um, let's uh, let's see here. Um, let us define a unary operator. Um, I guess there aren't that many, or actually there are essentially none, almost none. There are pseudo instructions that are unary, but I don't. There's no true unary operators in Risk Five. Like not, for example, is just XORing by uh, by an immediate, um, and negation is zero minus the thing. Um, but um, so maybe let's do op two first, since we actually have a bunch of uses of that. So. Um, if we take some random thing like plus, um, this is this is what I'm thinking. Is that we're going to define a macro for uh, quickly defining unary operators, and basically we're going to have um, we're going to have this code. So it takes two things on top of the stack and then um, does that, and um, And basically, I'm going to parameterize by the instruction uh, by the instruction mnemonic, um, so that we don't have to write all this uh, repetitive stuff. And I guess there's a next at the end as well. So that's just really for defining this boilerplate. Um, and so now we should be able to do def op two add plus uh, add. And just make sure that still works. And then we can do the same thing here. Um, I guess there are, yeah, there's, there actually are some of these pseudo, um, pseudo unary instructions. Um, let's make sure that still works. Um, let's do the same kind of thing for unary operations, of which there are fewer, but, um, So here there's no stack adjustment, it's just uh, the top element gets replaced. And this gets rewritten. And so I think this is actually called invert. And we'll see if I'm using it anywhere. Um, yeah, Forth calls this invert. I was looking that up over the weekend. Um, okay. Um, not as a not as a synonym for this actually equal to zero. So uh, we can't. Easily, because it's using it's it doesn't quite fit the pattern um, we will not implement this using uh, one of those but you should be able to do eq0 um, like that. OK. 
Okay. And like I said, there's like others of these things. Like I mean, maybe I'll add this as a comment just to remind myself. Um, but yeah, if you um, you can do minus road by just doing two positive rotations, since the cycle or the cycle length of road is three. Um, and then you can look for a lot of this stuff. Let's see, there's some things you could find like. Like not, uh, not is just a synonym for um, equal to zero. Like if you're equal to zero, then you're one. If you're not, then something like that. Oh really? Oh right. I need, yeah, that's another thing. Right now, our uh, our interpreter doesn't do error checking. It just kind of bombs in the worst way when you try to compile a reference to um, a word that doesn't exist. Um, so that's something we can bootstrap as well. Um, we don't have to build that in. Um, Let's actually, for all of this stuff here, for all of these offsets, um, there's really no reason to have those hard coded. Yeah, so this isn't even referenced anywhere. It's only used through. So CFA is used. It's used to bootstrap. Um, DFA is definitely not used, right? Um, uh, right, flag offset. Flag offset is um, zero. I believe, right? It's the very first thing. Now I broke everything. Oh, right, we have to add. Because we're not just returning the offset, we're adding. Um, <laughs> still doesn't work. What did I screw up? Well, actually, in this case, we don't even have to do anything, right? It's just the top entry. Um, so for uh, a literal CFA, Doesn't worry too much about getting rid of that right now. Maybe the only things we. Yeah. Um, what literals are we using? Up to this point, the only literals we're using are zero and one. Using zero here. It doesn't need to be zero, this could be one. Yeah, 
let's make a zero. Uh, anyway, my idea is let's let's just I mean it. I delete that. Why does it? Uh, okay, that's weird. Okay, let's just leave those as those. Um, all right, all right, all right. Okay, we already have the definition here. And actually, I want to figure out why that old definition wasn't working. So, um, push a literal. Probably forgot a comma or something. Push a literal, and then add, and then exit. Okay, so that pushes a typo before. Um, What were the The only things we really need for the CFA is this. So maybe let's just do those. Um, so let's do name length. Um, eight. I guess we can't really do eight. Right now we don't have the literals for it, so let's just create one. Um, So that's eight. And we have to add it. And we have to exit. So this makes sense. Um, and then C of A, which is a bit more of a mouthful, but not by much. So we duplicate, uh, we duplicate the top entry. Um, and so first, We get the name. I think there has to be a swap here, right? Um, we first get the name, uh, and then we get the name length. Let's see. A little bit wrong. Um, you have to read the name length. So let's see this. You, you read the name length. Um, you read the name length. Then you swap and you read the name and then you add that to the name length you've read. And then you align it. That looks reasonable. OK. 
can't remember, do we have something called aligned? Um, I can't remember if it's built in. Okay, let's just use that for now, even though that's kind of a weird. It's easy to write yourself. Um, aligned. That's it. Just read that. Duplicate it because we need to get both the name and the name length. Um, first, we get the name length pointer. So we read, we dereference it to load the name length. Then we swap to get um, the original duplicated thing on top. Then we get its name pointer and we add the name length we fetched. And then we align that to four bytes, which this function does. And then we exit. Um, let me just call it like this first, just to make sure it compiles. And then um, CFA is used in our new interpreter. So it's really crucial that it works correctly. Um, and now it's, it should be live. And it doesn't work, which is not super surprising. Now the opportunities for typos. Um, before we use it like this, let's try to do some basic stuff like um, just to test it. I mean, it's super basic. Um, what if I do this? What if I say print? Eight and nine. And I mean, let's just make sure so it should be nine and ten. Um, so I do believe name length offset is eight, name offset is nine. Incidentally, I don't think this immediate, yeah, this is no longer needed. All of that stuff is just scaffolding. But stuff that's been removed. Um, all right, so these look legit. I mean, the flags works because the interpreter depends on it. Um, so for this thing here, let's see again. Uh, duplicate the top entry. Um, move to the name length. Fetch the name length, swap it so we can get the name pointer, then add that to the name length, then align it, and finally exit. That looks kind of reasonable. Um, That looks kind of reasonable, let me think. Um, how can I easily test this? There has to be a valid name length. I think I still have my, do I call it break? I still have this thing to debug, um, so I could use this. So if I take, um, let's see here. Um, what word should I read? I should read something near the top. Like, what's the very first word we define? It's drop. Um, it's drop. So, read drop. Find it. Um, and then break just to see how things are. Uh, let's see. Uh, All right, so on top of the stack is this here, which is presumably that. Um, 
given a 1024. Yeah, that looks about right. Um, that looks about right. Um, for that, and now let's try. I guess uh, let's, let's just duplicate it. So it's still there when we do the other stuff. Um, then let's try. Let's try getting the code field, code field, code field address and see what it, if it's in the ballpark. Oh, it's the point. <laughs> that is not in the ballpark. That is very far out of the ballpark. Um, let's b before doing this, let's try reading the reading the name length and just dereferencing it. Let's, let's just look at the fields to make sure the rest of the component functions are behaving reasonably. Um, all right, that's already total garbage, from what I can tell. Okay, so 24 plus 8 is indeed 32. Um, and then, oops. Um, but then when I read it, so I fetch from that address. Oh, it, sorry, that was my bad. So that's also my problem here, is that it should be a byte fetch. Let's see if that works. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the age old. Uh, I mean, how, how many times have you had this bug either in assembly code or in fourth code? Make sure you use the right kind of fetch. Um, so that works. Alrighty. Here. So yeah, that all works. Uh, I'm just gonna do this jump since it's not really pertinent anymore. Um, All right, I'm trying to think of what's the Let's see what that stuff we have no dependency on. Right. Um right, so one thing we don't have right now is um if anyone if anyone remembers one thing we uh we don't have is a general uh number parser. Um and we were basically getting around getting around that by just hard coding some dictionary entries with literal values that we needed, so zero through four. Um, of course, we want to be able to write general things like one, two, three, right? Like have that be say in decimal or or hex or whatever base you want. So um, um, right now we don't support that. That's something the interpreter has to support, and we don't support that. Um, so um, let's. Uh, Let's fix that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to redefine the interpreter again. Um, I'm going to redefine the interpreter again. So basically, and we could do it here, but I want to wait until we have, uh, like, we can we can use itself. To, we can use the compiler to compile a better version of interpret. So, you know, the very first act we could do would be, um, and you could do it, you could do it here. Um, word find dupe CFA swap um, immediate mode or grant. Oh, and, and then, you know, let's uh, actually wait until we have this stuff. Um, so what's it? Word find dupe CFA. Swap, yeah. 
do we have an immediate ward or is the mode one? Um, if so, then we um, then we execute it. Otherwise, we compile it, and I think that's it. Um, but now in order to actually use it, we have to also redefine quit. But again, now we can, we can define it using, and you know, let me start using better indentation conventions here. I think the code is more readable. Um, We have to recompile quit, by the way, because again, names are resolved at compile time. And so once quit has been compiled, uh, this word has been resolved to this definition. And so if we want to have a new command loop that uses the new version of interpret, we actually have to redefine the command loop. Uh, but of course, it's very simple. We just do this. Uh, and then we have to re-enter it. Um, this means we didn't mess up that little work. And that didn't work. Um, let's try this. Did I break something earlier? That was totally possible. Okay, so that worked. Uh, I guess I just had some typos because we still don't have very good error handling in this anemic interpreter. So um, get the next word, find the entry, duplicate, um, get the code field, swap back, check if the word is an immediate or if the mode is set to immediate. If either of those is true, then we uh, execute the thing on top of the stack. Otherwise, we just append it to the current entry we're compiling. Um, So that works. Um, this did not work. This definition of quit is interesting because this is very simple. Um, let me try using one instance of interpret. Like if I do interpret, um, let me find something like this. So let me just show you what I have in mind here. If I call this, I'm going to get a one. Um, if I call interpret one little digit, it should go through the new interpreter because that's what we just defined. So let me make sure that still works. Um, so that does work. Um, well, and we can make sure it gets hit by putting in a zero in front. So indeed, it does get hit. Um, but then for quit, it looked like quit was not working. And it was a very simple definition. So really, all we're doing is we have an infinite loop that calls interpret. Um, begin again. And it looked like even the definition of this like not even the execution, but even the definition of this was what was causing problems. Yeah. Which is interesting. So begin pushes here. Again, merely Let me think about what the issue might be.
Well, the interesting, it's almost like the stack gets messed up or something by the mere definition of it. Because, I mean, we're getting, getting after this point, you can see the first, uh, the first bunch of stuff is being defined. Let's see, the first amount of crap is being defined here. So we're doing this, but then somehow this is breaking, which suggests that maybe the stack is in a weird state or something. Um, let me just check the state of the stack before and after, um, before and after this stuff. So here the stack is empty, which is what I expect. Um, and here the stack is empty again. Which is also what I would expect. There shouldn't be anything at this point. Uh, one thing we could do that would probably be useful is if we have an immediate word that you can call like this. Well, you can actually do that manually. Here, the loop header should be on top of the stack. Right. And then this thing's still on top of the stack. Oops. And now it's no longer on top of the stack. By the way, what I'm doing here is I'm using this break word, um, but I'm putting it in these brackets, which, uh, if you recall, temporarily puts the system into immediate mode uh, and then back to compilation mode. So basically what this means is this is going to execute while it's compiling this stuff. So since begin is an immediate uh, word, this is going to execute and uh, push uh, the current you know, here address on the stack, and then this is going to break, so we, that's why we can see it on the stack. And the second one was showing that it's still on the stack. And then after again, we can show it's uh, off the stack, which is correct. So I was just making sure there wasn't some weird, like the stack wasn't getting put into a weird state for this. Um, I mean, we can do something similar here, which might be helpful. Just to make sure there's nothing with this function. Let's see, very first, so this should put the thing to back patch on top, and then right before the else, it's still there. Now there's a new thing. Now that should be off. I wonder if the code space is starting to get cramped here. Um, let's make this bigger. Okay, I think that maybe was the issue. 
there was some sort of overflow um, of those structures. So this hadn't allocated enough space in those sections, it looks like. Um, but anyway, so now that we have the new loop, we should be able to re-enter it. Um, so this is running out of the new loop. And we can see that by, you know, let, let's say we push the, th the four before every uh, time we enter the interpreter with the new loop. Uh, we should be able to see a crap load of fours now every time we do anything. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of funny, right? We start with with the dumb interpreter and the you know this bootstrap or this hard coded uh, interpreter loop and quit. Um, then we we create this version here, uh, sort of out of the very primitive uh, ingredients we have at this point. So it's kind of painstaking. We have to do this compilation manually. There's no notion of interpretation mode versus compilation mode at this point. Um, but once this is defined, we can use itself to redefine it more conveniently. So this initial definition here is actually just redefining it to have the same meaning, um, but now using you know much more natural syntax. Um, but one of the nice things we can do now is um, when there is not a word match, um, we can do something different than usual. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> Okay, first let's build some better error handling because that's been a thorn in our side since the beginning. Um, if you try to reference a word that isn't found, rather than just compiling garbage or interpreting garbage, let's check for that. So we know we get back a zero value. Um, we get back a zero value. Um, get back a zero value for the length. No, actually, let me. No, we get back a yeah, we get back a pointer. So if this is zero, I think that's it. Um, abort calls quit. So maybe. Um, but, but, but. Okay, let's define another function. Um, actually, there's some built-ins we should have defined a while ago that I never defined, which just directly manipulate the registers. So let me do that now. Um, uh, get sp, um, which Well, I guess you would easiest way to say is uh, move move SP into T1, uh, increment the stack, uh, store that. No, actually, I guess you can just do this. Maybe that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and then increment it afterwards. Um, set sp. What does this keep? I'm pairing shit. Uh, set sp takes. Uh, let's see here. It takes it takes from top of the stack, and then actually just loads it directly into sp. So this is, you have to be careful with this stuff, obviously, because the stack is used for data flow in order to set the stack pointer. So you have to be sure you only call this after everything is set up. Um, after everything is set up. And uh, uh, we do something similar for uh, 
why did it say store? I guess that's right actually. Store SP PC add SP plus four. Um, And this would be load PC from the top of the stack, and then pop that, and then go next. And so this next macro is actually going to pick up on the new PC that's being redirected to. Uh, and then we also need this for RP, which is the third register in the abstract machine. And this one's a bit simpler. I mean, this doesn't directly interfere with the stuff that's actively being manipulated. Um, oh, no, that is store, sorry. Store on top of the stack, return pointer, and increment it. Set RP and we load RP from top of the stack. We decrement it. Something like this. Um, so these, these are kind of low level register manipulation functions. Um, the thing we want to do is basically we want to write a function called abort which is a conventional function and what it does is basically regardless of how deep you are on the stack either the data stack or the return stack you reset everything to the initial state and jump to quit so this is basically like exception throwing an exception and catching it at the top level loop um, which is the conventional way to do you know to do sort of error handling you never want to bring the system down when reporting an error, that this is kind of going up to the top level so you can continue execution or interpretation or whatever it may be. Um, all right. Let's see here. Just make sure that still assembles. Um, the other thing we want to do. And we should probably um, these should be variables so that they can be if, if there's multiple threads um, we want to have be able to have stack pointers that are different for each of them so this should be an address in memory um, and so this is going to be la stack for now, um, LA stack into T1, and then um, something like this. So load the base address of the stack. So this is basically what we're initializing with here. Um, and uh, yeah, put that on top of the stack. Load that address, put it on top of the stack. Uh, we want to do the same thing for RP. Okay, um, and then what we can do is we can define a function abort. And what abort is going to do, let's see, we are going to Okay, let's. Um, you have to be careful about resetting the stack um, because 
once you've reset it, if you had something on the stack previously, now the stack pointer won't point to that. So you really can't do this if you expect to be able to access anything on the stack from before that point. Um, so uh, read the initial stack pointer. So this is how you reset the stack to zero. Um, so you can't expect to have anything on the stack at this point. But I think that's fine because now we can use the stack. So let's reset this first. Um, and then you can reset the return stack next. Um, and you can then um, put quit on the stack and return. I think that works if we put that on the return stack. Because once, I mean, you could probably do this different ways. Like we could also just call it and rely on the fact that this is never going to return. Uh, in which case, abort will be on top of this. Will will be the will be at the bottom. It's probably fine. Let's try this. Let me print something to signify that we're um, going. Let's make sure that still compiles. And then I'm going to abort. Now abort shouldn't actually, uh, in this context, since we're pretty much on top of the stack, this shouldn't be a big deal. Um, we should just continue, I mean, we should call quit again, so we're, we'll re-enter this command loop. Um, So maybe here's what I'll do. I'll have this at the top on the, on the entry to the infinite loop so that we can see when we re-enter it. So uh, just to show what I mean. So we get zero. The first zero is for entering the quit. Um, by the way, yeah. So if I now type abort, I'm just going to totally fuck up everything if I didn't implement it correctly. OK. So now you can see there's another zero. And this is where the stack got reset. Um, and we can see the stack is reset by doing a break before and after. That's probably a good idea. Um, well, and, and in particular, let's put a bunch of stuff on the stack uh, just to show that it gets killed. Okay, so you can see we have one, two, three, four on the stack. And if I quit, okay. Uh, it's probably not. I mean, it's probably the abort did not get implemented correctly and it was just accidentally working, maybe. Uh, let's see here. So, first breakpoint, uh, four things on top of the stack. And then crash Arena from a very big address. Maybe the problem is just, let me think here. When you call break, um, let me remove it from here put it here. It's possible. Yeah. So one, two, three, four on the stack. And then yeah. So there's definitely something very wrong there. Let me try clearing just that stack. Okay, so the problem is definitely that. If we only do one of them, even if we don't clear the stack, it just means we're going to run out of stack eventually, but that's, it should still work as long as we never return. Um,
Right, so here we haven't cleared the stack. So it's not the return part that's a problem. It's um, Let me think about the implications. There's probably something stupid in terms of the ordering. So, I'm emptying the stack. We're not expecting there to be anything on the stack at this point. So this is literally the same shit that I do at init time. I load the absolute address into T1. And I store it on top of the stack. Doing something stupid there. It looks okay. Let's see. So at this point, this thing should be on top of the stack. So that should be at SP minus four. So I'm loading that and I'm putting it into the stack pointer. Um, and so at this point, you know, next should not really be a problem. Next is just going to look at so it's going to look at the program counter. It doesn't use the stack at all. It doesn't read from the stack. And the reason you don't have you don't have to decrement the stack pointer afterwards, of course, is because you're setting it to a value. So um, you get the top value from the stack to reinitialize the stack pointer, but you're not like adjusting it afterwards like you would normally do when you're reading the top element of the stack and popping it or whatever. Interesting. Um, let me do some. Let me do some some checks here. Um, let's see. The stack pointer is at 64k. I'm going to set it a breakpoint there. Why is that never getting hit? This should be where oh this has to be temporarily move that. Um, okay. So the stack pointer, let me just remind myself of register, it's twenty-five. The stack pointer is 25. Yeah, I mean, that's clearly garbage. That's hard to. Hard for me to fathom, to be honest. I 
and no no I guess no wonder it's totally busted if that's actually uh what it's writing. So to the breakpoint there. Okay, so this is before the stack pointer. So so yeah, the stack at this point is empty. Uh and in fact it's no actually it's not empty. There's twenty divided by four. There's five items on the stack at this point. Um which makes sense because there's one, two, three, four, and then oh, it looks like it looks like this one is not getting read. Oh, that's right. Um, I'm reading from it. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's this is uh, this is what this is what the issue is. This is me being stupid because the thing I'm trying to push. Um, all right. Um. This is the issue. <laughs> this is the issue. Um, this is what I want to do, because I want these to be mutable. Um, so it, it does get initialized to the same thing always, but I want these to be mutable, to be task local variables once we add multitasking. Um, so this thing here should really be SB0. And uh, RP0. Let's see if that's more reasonable. So the stack pointer is here, and now if we, uh, if I set the breakpoint to the next thing, then it gets reset, yeah, so that looks much better. So that's what the issue was. I can do it another way, I suppose. All right. Um, So this is a stack with all this garbage on top, and now we are back to an empty stack. Garbage, back to empty stack. Looks good. Um, well, and I, I should actually verify that, yeah, all this stuff is working. All right, so we can remove those bricks. So this will actually reset the stack and go into exit. And like I said, you can, what was the trick I was going to use? If you don't want a board to be, if you want quit to be the topmost thing on the stack, it doesn't matter much. It doesn't matter if a board is on the stack because quit is never going to return. But if you want to kind of tail call into it, a, a trick you can do is um, push the code pointer for quit. And um, since the return stack is empty at this point, um, rather than calling it, you just push that as the continuation. Uh, and then when this thing exits, it's actually going to tail tail call into and quit. That should work. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Use this. <laughs> Very clearly not. This should give me the code field address. And then when I push this on the stack. Um, so that's from the stack, and this is to the stack. For now, let's just do this. Let's find that new. Um, 
All right. Um, so now we have the ability to abort, which means that we also have the ability to, for example, do error messages and stuff like that. So how are we doing on time? We've already been going an hour and a half. Um, all right. Where were we? Um, no, I guess we can remove that. That was just for debugging. All right, I'm going to um, I'm going to I guess we've been going over an hour and a half. So I'm going to uh, cut off the mainstream, um, uh, and take a, a like a quick bathroom break, and then I'm going to restart the recording. But the stream will continue uh, in a second. So uh, thanks for coming by, and uh, uh, I'll continue this hackery.